Amen. Turn in your Bibles, if you would please, to the book of 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, and in just a few moments, I'll begin reading in verse number 1 of that chapter. 2 Corinthians chapter number 8 and verse number 1. I'll say more about this in the service tonight, but Cassie and I are so appreciative for the opportunity to have been with you during this missions conference. I appreciate what the Lord is doing here. And uh, it's been so apparent that the groundwork has been laid for this missions conference. And I want to thank Pastor Shiflet. I want to thank this wonderful staff. And I want to thank you, church family. Thank you for being here. Thank you for praying. And I trust the Lord. I trust the Lord as you follow your pastor will lead you into even greener pastors in the days to come. I appreciate the hills. I appreciate their burden for Argentina. All of the missionaries have been used of the Lord this week in a wonderful, wonderful way. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. Would you please stand with me as we read the first five verses of Scripture together. The Apostle Paul, as he was led of the Holy Ghost of God to do so, writes, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Let's bow our heads, shall we, for a moment of prayer. Father, thank you for the inspired, inerrant word of the living God of glory. Father, it doesn't matter what I have to say this morning. It's not what I have to say that will make an eternal difference. But Lord, it certainly matters what you have to say. And so I pray that each of us would be attentive to what you are saying to us through the pages of your inspired, inerrant word. Help me, I pray, I'm nothing without thee. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for standing. You can be seated. With the help of the Lord and while zeroing in on the truths found within this, the first portion of 2 Corinthians chapter number 8, I felt impressed of the Lord to preach on this thought. A working faith that finances the great work of reaching the world with the gospel. Now, before we go any further into the message, let's take a few moments, shall we, in order that we may consider the context of the Apostle Paul's writing these verses of Scripture. When you study your Bible, you'll discover that after waiting a full year for the Corinthian church to fulfill a promise to participate in a special offering for the saints at Jerusalem, Paul is writing the text before us in order to persuade the Corinthians to do what they had promised earlier in the year they would do. In an effort to be effective in doing so, Paul begins to use the churches of Macedonia as an example in giving. After all, the Bible teaches us they had participated in the same offering as a direct result of the report they had initially received from Paul concerning the church of Corinth's promise to give. Now, we know that because we've taken the time to study 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. There, Paul declared in the latter portion of verse 2 of that chapter, your zeal, speaking of course of the Corinthians' zeal, have provoked very many. As a result of the Corinthians' promise to give, the Macedonian churches promised to give as well. However, when you study your Bible, you'll discover that there was a vast difference between the Corinthians' promise to give and the Macedonians' promise to give. 
the Corinthians' promise turned into procrastination, while the Macedonians' promise turned into performance. The Word of God teaches us when it came to giving, the Corinthians delayed while the Macedonians dedicated themselves to the cause of Christ through their giving. I say that because the Bible teaches us that God would work through the Macedonian church's giving to finance the great work of reaching others with the gospel. Now that truth assures us this morning, ladies and gentlemen, there is a reason. There is a reason that God has forever preserved these verses of Scripture in our King James Bibles this morning. I submit to you that God still, after all these years, has a plan to finance the great work of world evangelization. And I believe with all of my heart that plan is revealed in the same truths that Paul is conveying here in the text before us concerning the Macedonian church's giving with the Corinthian believers. Why, you don't think for one moment that Jesus would have commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature without a plan to finance that great work, do you? I submit to you, absolutely not. God does have a plan, and that plan is clearly, are you listening? It is clearly revealed in the text before us. And since that plan includes me, since it includes you, and in fact all of the church of the living God, I believe it would certainly behoove each of us to consider God's simple plan for financing the great work of reaching others with the gospel. Therefore, for just a few moments, we're going to dig into these five verses of Scripture. I don't have time. Time will not allow me to go into 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. And so since we can't cover both chapters, we'll zero in on the first five verses of 2 Corinthians chapter number 8. But first things first this morning. First things first. When you study your Bible, you discover that God in His Word primarily speaks of three different types of giving. First and foremost, there is the tithe. Now the word tithe simply means a tenth and speaks of a tenth of one's financial increase that God has ordained to be given from each and every one of his children in order that the financial needs of the local Bible-believing church would be met. Now hear me this morning, just as God has a plan to finance the great work of world evangelization with the gospel, he also has a plan that he clearly reveals in the Bible to finance the needs of his local Bible-believing church. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is through and by the tithes of God's people. Now hear me, the Bible is abundantly clear. The tithe, are you listening? Say amen. Amen. The tithe is the starting point of all of our giving. Missions offering isn't the starting point of all of our giving. Sacrificial giving, voluntary offerings, that's not the starting point of all of our giving. The Bible teaches us that the tithe is the starting point of all of our giving. Now, the same Bible that teaches us that the tithe is the starting point is the same Bible that teaches us that it should never be the stopping point. I like to say it like this. The tithe isn't the ceiling we stop at. The tithe, according to the Bible, is merely the floor that we stand upon. It is the starting point, or it should be the starting point of all of our giving. The Bible teaches us that Abraham commenced it. He tithed before there even was a law. Jacob continued it. Moses commanded it. Jesus commended it in the New Testament. And therefore, who in the world am I, or who in the world are you to cancel it? Hear me, the Bible says in Leviticus chapter 27 and verse 30, the tithe is the Lord's and it is holy unto him. 
Hear me, I am fully convinced that every need of the local Bible-believing church would be met if God's people would simply follow God's plan and tithe. That is exactly why God said through the pen of the Old Testament prophet Malachi in Malachi chapter 3, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. That word storehouse is the Old Testament equivalent to the New Testament church. Bring ye all the tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Hear me this morning, church. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 10 is just one portion of the Bible out of many that assures me it's not a burden to tithe. Brother, it's a blessing to tithe. Tithing doesn't produce poverty. Quite the contrary. Tithing produces plenty. Somebody told me one time, preacher, I can't afford to tithe. If you're saved, you can't afford not to tithe. <laughs> I'll say this, that I'm moving, and some of you are thankful. I have never met a spiritual Christian that wasn't a scriptural tither. Let me back up and say that again. I have never met a spiritual Christian that wasn't a scriptural tither. And so the Bible speaks of the tithe. Secondly, the Bible speaks of sacrificial giving or voluntary offerings. Now, this type of giving is beyond the tithe. For instance, the children of Israel gave of their own treasures when it came to the erection of the tabernacle in the wilderness. That, ladies and gentlemen, is a wonderful example of sacrificial giving in order that the work of God might move forward. Opportunities always abound for God's people to give sacrificially over and above their regular tithes and offerings through the ministry of the local church. I noticed when I drove onto the property for the first time this week getting ready for the conference, my soul, uh, you have worked so hard just on the outward appearance. These buildings, I, I love the colors. It looks so fresh. It looks so new. Uh, you know what I'm impressed by? Every building looks the same. Man, it's nice. It looks great. The parking lot is immaculate. All of the curbing on the parking lot, all of the stripes on the parking lot. Man, you've got so many folks in the parking lot. You better have some stripes out there on the parking lot. All of that was an opportunity for you to invest by giving sacrificially. You gave your regular tithes and offerings, but then you gave sacrificially. That is a wonderful example of voluntary offerings, giving over and above the tithe so that the ministry of the local church can move forward. I'm sure your pastor will feel led in the days to come if you're going to build that gymnasium. You'll have opportunity after opportunity to give sacrificially. Hey, listen, don't begrudge that. Thank God for the opportunity. What better way to exercise your faith than in the area of giving? So there is the tithe. There is sacrificial giving. But then there is the most blessed giving of all. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is giving by faith for the sake of others. And the more I read and study my Bible, the more I am absolutely convinced that God intends for the world to be evangelized by means of this type of giving. I like to call it the missions offering. It's giving by faith for the sake of others. Some call it grace giving, and it is grace giving, but I personally prefer the term faith promise giving because I think the term more adequately describes what Paul is talking about here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 as well as 2 Corinthians chapter number 9. I submit to you this morning just as God has a plan to finance his local church through the tithes of his people, that same God has a plan to finance the evangelization of the world and that is giving by faith. And so in just a very, very few moments this morning, let's zero in, shall we? 
about this matter of giving by faith over and above yes. our regular tithes and offerings for the sake of others. Paul is writing about the churches of Macedonia here. And when you study your Bible, you'll discover that he is primarily speaking of the church of Philippi, the church of Thessalonica, as well as the church of Berea. Paul writes again according to verse number one of the text and says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia. Now notice what Paul begins to specifically teach us about these churches that gave by faith. First of all, notice number one, the problems their faith had to overcome. The problems their faith had to overcome. The Word of God makes it abundantly clear in the text that the Macedonian churches refused to let two very great problems detour them in their giving. Uh, that is to say, they gave by faith in spite of some things. And can I tell you this morning, Calvary Baptist Church, if you're going to give by faith, there will always be obstacles that your faith will have to overcome. That's why you call it faith promise. You say, preacher, I just don't see it. <laughs> if you could see it, there'd be no faith to it. Because the Bible says, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. There will always be problems your faith will have to overcome. First of all, these Macedonian churches, they gave in spite of great affliction. Do you see it in verse 2? Paul spoke of their great affliction in verse number 2. And by doing so, he assures us that these Macedonians knew what it was like to suffer for the cause of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also spoke of the Thessalonian suffering in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 when he wrote, For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews. He also referred to the Thessalonian suffering in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 as well as 2 Thessalonians chapter number 1. They gave in spite of great affliction. They not only gave in spite of great affliction, they gave in spite of deep poverty. Isn't that exactly what your Bible says in the text? You've got to understand this morning, friend, these Macedonian churches were living in extreme poverty. That is exactly what your Bible teaches us. And therefore, I must say, it would have been tremendously easy for them to get their eyes only upon their own needs, only upon their own circumstances. But in spite of their affliction, in spite of their deep poverty, the Word of God teaches us that their heart was still towards God and reaching others with the gospel. Amen. And do you want to know how we can know that their heart was towards God and reaching others with the gospel? I'll tell you how we can know. We know their heart was there because they had put their treasure there. And isn't that exactly what the Lord Jesus said would happen according to Matthew chapter 6 when he said, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. These Macedonian churches, their heart was in missions. Their heart was in soul winning. Their heart was in church planting. Their heart was in world evangelism. Why? I'll tell you why. Because they put their treasure there and when they put their treasure there, their heart followed. Now I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to make a confession right here, preacher. For years I preached Matthew chapter number 6 wrong. I did. As a pastor. Man, I'd lay into our folks every now and then and I'd say, you know what you need to do? You need to put your heart into this church. Put your heart into this church. If you teach Sunday school class, you ought to put your heart in that Sunday school class. And if you put your heart in things around here, your treasure will follow. That's not what the Bible says. Jesus said you put your treasure there first. 
then your heart will follow. Preacher, do you want to know why some folks don't have a heart for this ministry? Check the given record. Hey, I'm going home tomorrow anyway. You want to know why some folks don't have a heart for what we're doing around here? These flags mean nothing to them. The people's faces mean nothing to them because they are not investing in souls that Jesus shed his blood for on the cross of Calvary. Jesus said it, and he said it, ladies and gentlemen, without apology. You want your heart to be somewhere? You put your treasure there, and when you put your treasure there, your heart will fall follow these Macedonian churches. Their heart was in world evangelism. Their heart was in soul winning. Their heart was in reaching others with the gospel. Why? Because they had put their treasure there. In spite of great affliction, in spite of deep poverty, they gave over and above their tithes by faith so that others could hear the gospel. And when they put their treasure there, their heart followed. Oh, but preacher, you, you just don't know. Preacher, I got a stack of bills on my table. That hot, Birds have bills too, but they still sing. <laughs> preacher, you just don't know. You don't know what the doctor does. There will always be obstacles your faith will have to overcome right. if you're going to enjoy the blessings of giving by faith. Right. And so we see the problems their faith had to overcome. Secondly, we see the pattern of their faith. The Word of God reveals it right here in verse 3. Look what your Bible says. Paul writes, For to their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power they were willing of themselves. Here we see the pattern of their faith. First of all, the Word of God is very deliberate to teach us that they started giving to their power. That's where it started. They started giving to their power. Now, isn't it amazing? This is unlike the tithe. God's starting point for the tithe is 10%. There's no percentage here. God says... Here's where I want you to start giving by faith for the sake of others. I'll tell you what, sit down, figure your, figure your monthly budget out, figure what you can afford to give. If you've never given to missions before, over and above your regular tithes and offerings, sit down and figure up what you can afford to give. That's exactly what these Macedonian churches did. They started giving to their power. But when they started giving to their power, there was a holy dissatisfaction with that. And so then they said, Lord, we want to do more than what we can afford. So Lord, what we want to do, we're going to exercise our faith right here, Lord, in this matter of giving. And Lord, we want to see others reached with the gospel to the point. We're so fired up about world evangelism. We're so thrilled about how you're using Paul to plant churches and win souls all over the world. We want to have a part in that, Lord, because we realize that'll be fruit that'll abound to our account when we stand at the judgment seat one day. So, Lord, what we want to do, we're going to exercise our faith and we're going to take a step of faith right here, Lord. We're going to trust you to give through us what you would never give to us. And they exercise their faith when it come to this matter of giving and when God saw their faith, yeah. Yeah. he was so impressed. Yeah. You want to move the heart of God? Take him at his word. Yes. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Amen. When they started exercising their faith, particularly in this matter of giving, God saw that he could trust them and he started giving through them what he would never give to them. And by doing so, it enabled them to give Beyond their power. Amen. That's right. 
And isn't that exactly what verse 3 says? Verse 3 says, For to their power I bear record, yea, and what? Beyond their power they were willing of themselves. So much, in fact, if you were to go to the church at Philippi, if you were to go to the church of Thessalonica, if you were to go to the church of Berea and walk in their church and see all of the missions letters posted, if you saw all of the flags of the countries where they had started churches, you would ask them, wow, you're living in extreme poverty. Uh, you're suffering great affliction. How in the world can you do all that for world evangelism? Do you know what they'd say? Huh, it's beyond me. They gave beyond their power. There are many examples I could give you from the Bible. Let me just mention one quickly, and I'll give you an illustration, and I'll move on quickly with my last two points. 1 Kings chapter 17. Elijah strides right into King Ahab's house and he informs him as a result of his idolatrous, ungodly lifestyle that God was going to send a famine to the land. And that is exactly what God did. God gave Elijah permission to camp out by the brook Cherith. The Bible teaches us that the ravens, the old scavenger birds, brought him bread and flesh in the morning and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank from the waters of the brook. But after a while, because there had been no water in the land, the brook began to dry up. And so God sent him to a little town of the Mediterranean coast between Tyre and Sidon, a little place by the name of Zarephath. And there at that unlikely place, God would send an unlikely person into Elijah's life to make provision for the man of God. Elijah comes to the gate of the city and when he reaches the gate of Zarephath he sees a little widow woman and the widow woman is gathering sticks there and Elijah calls to her and says fetch me I pray thee a little water in a vessel that I may drink the lady turns now remember there's a famine going on the lady turns to go get the water the man of God calls to her again and says and while you're at it bring me a morsel of bread in thine hand as well and it stops the woman in her tracks so she turns around in the midst of the famine in the midst of the drought and she says to the man of God according to 1 Kings chapter 17 has the Lord thy God liveth I have not in cake but in a handful of meal in a barrel and a little oil in a cruise and man of God I'm out here gathering a few sticks so I can go in and dress it for me and my son we've already made out our last will and testament we're going to eat it and then we're going to die and then Elijah makes a very somewhat, at least at that point, conceded request. Make me thereof a little cake first. Make me thereof a little cake first. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Matthew 6, 33. But seek ye first, say it with me, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness make me thereof a little cake first and afterward make for thee and for thy son for thus saith the Lord God of Israel the barrel of meal shall not waste neither shall the cruise of oil fail according to the word of the Lord as he speaks through Elijah do you know what that widow woman did that widow woman took her little old bony hand put it in that meal barrel and she come out with what she had within her power to give to the ministry of the man of God she she took that meal, she took that oil, and she answered the request from the man of God. The next day, she did not have within her power to give anything else. But God did. And so the next day, when that widow woman went out there to the barrel, you know what she did? She stuck her hand in and come out with another handful. And the next day, she had another handful. And the next day, she had another handful. And the next day, are you getting where I'm going with this? When God saw that he could trust that little widow woman, God began to do for her what she did not possess within her own power to do. God put meal in the barrel. God put oil in the the cruise and God gave through her what he would never give to her to keep and the Bible says that she and he and her son did eat many days the pattern of their giving <laughs> number three I love preaching here 
the partnership of their giving. Verse number four teaches us that the churches of Macedonia literally pleaded. They begged Paul to take their offering. You want to know why? I'll tell you why. Because they realized then what very few churches as a whole realized this morning, and that is the fact it isn't just that Brother Raleigh Hill and his family need you. Now, to please don't misunderstand. They do need you. Cassie and I need you. We can't do what God has called us to do without you. But wait a minute, church. There's only one way that you can be obedient to God's command to reach the world with the gospel. You can't do it without the missionary. And so since Jesus said in John's gospel, chapter 14, and verse number 15, if you love me, keep my commandments... There's only one way you can be obedient to keep God's commands. You've got to have the missionary. Yes, they need you, but you need them. We are co-laborers together, the partnership of their faith. And finally, in verse number five, you see the priority of their faith. And this they did, watch your Bible, Not as we hoped, which simply means the Macedonian church's giving far exceeded what Paul could have ever hoped for. And this they did, not as we hoped, but isn't this amazing? There's that word again. First, gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. In other words, I want you to watch me in closing. They didn't do this. You know what this is? This is your faith promise card. You guys have been praying already this week about what the Lord would have you to do to reach the world with the gospel. This is your very faith promise card. In just a few minutes, your pastor is going to give you an opportunity to make an investment in which you will never lose. And you're going to take that faith promise card... And you're going to put it in the offering plate. But wait a minute. The Bible says that the Macedonian churches, they didn't do this. Now they did that, but not first. First. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Show it. Show it. Yes, sir. They put themselves. In the offering plate. And watch this, watch this. This is amazing how this works. When they put themselves in the offering plate, why? I want you to look what went right in there with it. You want to know why some folks never do this? You know why they're put, listen, good number here today. And I've pastored Independent Fundamental Baptist for 22 years. I know. There's somebody here this morning. You already ticked off because I'm preaching on giving. You know why you're ticked off? You've never done this. And by the way, I'm going to keep on. Look, if it does tick you off, I'm going to keep on preaching. Because I don't want you to miss the joy. I don't want you to miss the opportunity. Listen, this thing's fixing to be wrapped up, man. The Lord Jesus is coming again. I'm going to preach right along those lines tonight. And when Jesus comes again, you know where we're going? Oh, yes, I know there's going to be a reunion in the clouds, but we're going to the judgment seat, friend. And there in the judgment seat, we're going to give an account of how faithful we have been to carry out God's command to reach the world with the gospel. And I assure you, when you stand at the judgment seat, you or I, either one, will never say, Man, I wish I wouldn't have given all that money to missions. Why in the world did I make that faith promise? Man, I could have bought the bigger bass boat. I could have spent more time in the nail parlor. I could have had more material. Oh, no, no, no. You be glad at the judgment seat there was a day that you put yourself in the offering plate because when you put yourself in, everything else... Everything else will take care of itself. And so my appeal to you in closing is this. It isn't, have you done this? Have you done this? 
Because all of that will take care of itself if you do this. First, the priority of their faith. First, can I ask you in closing this morning? Have you give God the greatest offering of all? And the greatest offering of all isn't this. The greatest offering of all isn't that. Oh. <laughs> the greatest offering of all is yourself. You've listened so well. Would you stand to your feet all over the building?